Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Young. I'm a contributing editor with the publication Hydrogen Economist. The World Energy Council, in collaboration with the Electric Power Research Institute and PwC, has produced an innovation and insight briefing related to hydrogen. And I'm joined by our panel to discuss the report and the work that they have been doing to help enable the growth of the hydrogen economy. Forming the panel, we have Dr. Angela Wilkinson, Secretary General and CEO of the World Energy Council. Hi there, Angela. Hi, Tom. We have Jeroen van Hoof, Global Energy Utilities and Resources Leader at PwC. Hello. And finally, we have Neva Espinosa, VP for Energy Supply and Low Carbon Resources at the Electric Power Research Institute. Hello. Hi, Neva. Angela, why don't you start us off and tell us why we are e-gathered here today? Oh, thanks, Tom, and hello, everybody who's joined us. Um, we've been monitoring hydrogen for over a decade, and there's been a big uptick in interest in recent years. There's a million and one advocates for the new hydrogen economy, and it's really timely that we have an independent and impartial view at the state of play. And I'm delighted that EPRI and uh, PwC, two of our global patrons, have joined us in this effort. And we're one week away from the Tokyo Olympics. And what we're going to discuss today is the realities of the new hydrogen games. Thanks, Angela. Jerome, can you talk about the demand side a little bit? What are the demand-centric perspectives for hydrogen? Sure, no, I'm happy to do so. I think by now everybody is convinced that uh, if, you, if you take the Paris goals in mind, that to meet the Paris goals, electrification will, do, will bring us a long way, but not the whole way. So that means we will need to uh, get green molecules in the system if we want to meet those targets. And that's where hydrogen can play a role. Think about sectors like chemicals, steel production, aviation, uh, heavy duty uh, transportation. That's where it will play. But there's a few preconditions to create that demand. And that is that only after 2030, this will be economically viable. And that means in the next decade, that will happen, but now things will need to uh, be done to get there. And that's investing in the existing infrastructure and get pilot projects off the ground. If that happens until 2030, I'm convinced hydrogen will play a very significant role in the decarbonization of all those sectors. It will be something between four and 10 times the current use of hydrogen. That's our estimate. And that depends a little bit on where uh, competitive technologies will go. Uh, think about battery storage, energy efficiency, and the pickup of that. But in any case, a big, a big uptick if those two conditions are met. Thanks, you, Ryan. Angela, do you see demand emerging in a similar way across regions, or will there be differences over the next decade or so as that demand emerges? We see great diversity in the developments in hydrogen in different regions. Hydrogen developments are happening in all world regions, but they're mostly the drivers of demand for hydrogen are different. There's diversity in the, the sectors that are going to use uh, hydrogen. And there's also diversity in the policies that are being able to use to enable the development of the global hydrogen value chain. And so we need to think of the new hydrogen games, not as a hundred meter sprint, but more in terms of a pentathlon with relays happening in different regions. And as Jeroen said, it's going to take a lot of investment on the technology side, but it's also important that we don't forget about the talent side that's going to be needed to bring new capabilities into these incredible global hydrogen Olympic Games that are ongoing around the world now. And those differences across countries and regions that Angela mentioned, Neva, can be strengths, but they can also be barriers to hydrogen development. Have you got any thoughts on that? Absolutely. When I think about differences across regions, I can't help but think about the great hydrogen color debate. So the color discussion around hydrogen started as a way to more simply communicate hydrogen sourcing. It's become more increasingly complex with more colors and even shades of different colors. And part of that, it's been become increasingly less useful when discussing hydrogen. At the end of the day, the focus for hydrogen production should be on its carbon intensity, not on what feedstock for the hydrogen is being used. This will allow groups to meet their decarbonization goals in a much more efficient manner, as opposed to picking particular colors. Thanks, Neva. 
Jerome, turning to you, assuming that hydrogen barriers are removed, what are the potential in implications in terms of jobs and, and employment? Oh, yeah. Well, there's significant potential there. Think about it in two ways, new, new jobs and existing jobs. If you think about the infrastructural developments that are required, I mentioned refitting a system, but also the existing skilled technology people in, for example, oil and gas majors, using them for this transition will give them new purpose in that role. They will need upskilling uh, and new technologies will play a role in that respect. So it's important that upskilling will happen. Uh, again, an important issue, but uh, I think uh, replacement uh, of, of those roles by new opportunities uh, will happen. But there's more uh, in terms of new jobs. Think about the adjacent sectors. I mentioned aviation, I mentioned chemicals. So when this all picks up in those sectors, there will be, again, ample opportunity for new jobs and new opportunities for those people. Thanks, Jeroen. That's obviously interesting because a lot of interest in hydrogen is related to potential jobs and economic opportunities that could come with the development of the sector. Neva, could you tell us a bit more about these economic perspectives related to uh, the development of a hydrogen economy? Yeah, so I think it's really important when you think about the economics of the hydrogen economy, we understand it's very much going to vary across the globe. Production methodologies and usage will, that will be favorable in specific regions will be focused on that region's needs, their natural resources, their industry. So I like to say that optionality is not an option. We're going to need an abundance of technology solutions to ensure the economics and the reliability and resiliency of the future energy system is most effective for a given region. Thanks, Neva. And Angela, finally, any further thoughts or anything that we as viewers should take away from the discussion and the report? Well, as, as you talked about the hydrogen high jump of getting up to either four or 20%, as Neva's talked about it, we need less color prejudice we need more cooperation and more learning with and from each other across the diversity of different plays in hydrogen that are happening in different regions. And this is why EPRI, uh, PwC and, and the World Energy Council have come together. It's really important to have this independent, impartial view of the state of the new hydrogen games. And we're in a stepping stone here as we move into the next phase of looking at how do we engage with all this diversity in different regions, learn with and from each other, and convene multi-sector, multi-stakeholder, and multi-level conversations to make sure that nobody is left out or left behind as the hydrogen games unfold. Thanks, Angela, and thanks to you, Neva, and your own for that interesting discussion, and to our viewers with whom the panel hopes to have an ongoing dialogue via regional workshops and webinars going forward. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks, Thank everyone. you.